Um, and with that, I will kick it off to Mayor Natu, if you'd like to welcome everyone in. Thank you very much, uh, Leanne, and good morning to everyone that's been able to make it to the call and welcome to our first virtual workshop uh, with agribusinesses in Sturgeon County. We appreciate your attendance for sure. Uh, engaging with you virtually like this is new for everybody, as you can tell, so my apologies for dialing in late. Um, I know this will be a learning experience for all of us. Uh, I've been referencing in my video addresses as well, and I'll share it again here, uh, to say that we're living in times of uncertainty is quite an understatement. Uh, and this was certainly echoed as well in the Premier's uh, televised address just on Monday evening. Um, there is a silver lining to, uh, to consider in times of uncertainty or in times of crisis. Uh, I'm a firm believer that opportunities uh, can arise if we are, you know, have our eyes lifted on the horizon and can find them. So it's definitely a test for us to get innovative and creative and solution-based uh, and to look at things through a different lens, perhaps going forward than what we have in the past. And it's also an opportunity for communities to really um, grow stronger together. Uh, and so I hope that this is an opportunity for us to be able to uh, to do that. Uh, today we're also uh, considering our springboard in initiating Sturgeon County's desire to engage and collaborate with our agribusiness sector to first off identify how companies are adapting or how farms are adapting producers, how you're coping, uh, how you're pivoting uh, during this difficult time, and secondly just to start a conversation to determine uh, potential paths forward and how uh, we at the county can uh, support you and how our economic development team can support what is obviously a really important uh, sector to Sturgeon County, to Alberta and also um, to all of Canada. So to just set the tone and context for today and for the following workshops that we're hosting, I'll just give you a few statistics and some of them are, you know, as far back from 2016 from the last uh, census, but Canada is the fifth largest agriculture exporter in the world. Uh, and in some of the work we're doing at the Regional Ag Master Plan Task Force also, it's been determined just looking at land use uh, and economies in other countries, Canada is poised to be actually one of the last six main food uh, exporters. Uh, so there's certainly things we can do to protect that position and strengthen it as well. The agriculture and agri-food industry employs 2.3 million Canadians. So that's one in every eight jobs in Canada is, comes from the ag sector. Canada is the world's largest exporter and one of the largest producers of flaxseed and canola. Uh, pulses, oats, and durum wheat. Uh, and Canada is also the world's largest producer of dry peas, lentils, uh, and producing slightly over half of the world's lentils in 2017. And I might see some of the world's best lentils as well. Um, our ag business sector is quite diverse and includes raw feed stocks as well. Uh, and we have a strong processing sector and there may be some opportunity for us to, to build out uh, that as well. Alberta ranks third in Canada, so $13.6 billion in contribution toward the total Canadian food manufacturing sales um, of 95.7 billion. So 13.6 billion out of 95.7 is quite large and we follow Ontario and Quebec in that production. The value-added food processing and manufacturing employs approximately uh, just over 18,000 uh, people in Alberta annually and represents 14% of Alberta's manufacturing workforce. And I know for, um, for those involved in market gardens, the temporary foreign workers and the restrictions that have been put on there is certainly added to what was already an existing labor shortage. So we'll be interested to hear in the different ag sectors where your challenges are uh, with labor. Also within the value added food sector and subsectors, Alberta is dominated by meat processing, uh, grain and oil seed milling. However, increasingly uh, the province is growing capabilities in pulse crops and other niche specialty crops as well. 
as you all know, we have a long and proud history of farming and agriculture that dates back you know, well over the last 100 years. And we are uh, an agriculture powerhouse that contributes to our provincial and national ag landscapes. The total uh, farm acres uh, in, the Stur in Sturgeon County is 480,000 acres, predominantly with class one soils. Uh, and certainly where there aren't class one soils, there is the expertise, history and knowledge of the producers to put whatever inputs they need into to get yields uh, that are very close to what class one soils could, um, could produce. In 2016, gross farm receipts totaled $230 million. Uh, and that's a 24% increase from 2011. So obviously we're 2020 now, I look forward to seeing where those numbers go. Um, we have 230 million in farm receipts, so gross sales from 2016. Was, that was the largest average capital per farm uh, in the Edmonton metro region. So, and we are still largely uh, far more, uh, produce uh, more in our farming acres than the others in the metro region as well. So it's certainly incumbent on us to figure out what we can do to continue to support you in, you know, in owning that. We also have um, the largest, the region's largest poultry population uh, at almost a million birds here in Sturgeon County. And we're um, also home to University of Alberta Research Farm. So that's it's a great relationship for us to be able to cultivate and, and find out how that can tie in to support the work that you're doing. Uh, COVID-19 presents an immediate uh, need an opportunity to develop and support and sustain our local food supply chain um, and just drawing attention that growing local supporting local eating local these are all really important things but they're really important now as we go to our grocery store shelves and find out that there's some interruptions in the in the supply chain and some of the local growers have already articulated uh, to our active team that they're anticipating a really busy season uh, and we're excited about that um, but knowing that there's also just some upsets in what your you know, regular um, seeding harvest season might look like. So we just wanna be able to be supportive wherever possible because we know no matter what's going on in our lives, the seasons happen um, and seeding will you know, eventually come once this uh, snow decides to disappear. So um, again, we know that, that we have a strong sector. You guys have you know, earned that over the years and we just wanna be able to find out how we can support you in navigating uh, how the local food supply chain is going uh, and also in some later workshops, understanding in the commodity crops, uh, how the export system is working for you uh, and if you have any ideas around value add back, uh, back here at home. So, um, we do have a number of counselors that have also um, called in today. So uh, before I hand it over to Leanne, I would just like to uh, invite the counselors that are on the call uh, just to keep it organized. Um, we'll start with division one. I'm not sure who's all here, but we'll just start uh, numerically. And if you're here, please introduce yourself uh, and then we'll hand it over to, uh, to Leanne. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Kristen Toms, Counselor for Division 2. I don't believe we have Division 1 here right now. So welcome to the call, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Counselor Wayne Bolkenfor here, Division 3. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I think that uh, we're entering new and challenging times, but uh, with every, every throughout history, whenever there's a problem, that becomes an opportunity. And I think this is... Um, uh, ground zero for us to uh, flush out the opportunities that may pose themselves for us because we're we're strong as a community. We have uh, great agriculture here, and uh, I look forward to this conversation today. Thank you. I think Councillor Como was having some audio issues, so I'm not sure if he's got those solved yet. Yeah, I know. I know he was uh, in on the call earlier, but uh, I know obviously is sometimes a cell phone coverage is spotty, and uh, he does have some issues there. So, but we do know that he'll be on the call 
when he when he can be. So thank you for that. And I guess we uh, five and six, Councillor Ty and Councillor Shaw are unavailable. So, uh, but thank you to those of you on council who were able to dial in today. And just to uh, wrap up, uh, just a reminder of you know what we're facing and and what our concerns are. Uh, today is uh, Vimy Ridge Day, um, so if we can use some of the technology innovation and just uh, you know downright uh, Canadian uh, know-how. Uh, we'll be successful fighting this as we were on Jimmy Ridge. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and I don't think I mentioned earlier, my name is Leanne McBean. I'm uh, with our economic development team at Sturgeon County. Um, so we're going to just take you through some high level resources here. Um, anything that we're offering in these next couple of slides is um, stri is straight from the direct source. So just so you're aware, there are some resources available for businesses, businesses at um, the federal government level. So we will be handing, we will be emailing you a copy of the slides as well after this session. Um, and feel free to uh, ask any questions if you jump in here. Um, so there are quite a few that the federal government has released and they're all listed on their website. Um, Alberta as well has got some information and resources out for businesses and residents. And then Sturgeon County is also putting together, um, we have a, if you go to sturgeoncounty.ca slash COVID-19, we have a resource page there that is constantly being updated. So there's information there for residents, for um, facilities, businesses, um, all sorts of great resources for you and that's being continuously updated as well as, as things come online. Um, and so we are doing our best to support and this is uh, after a couple of slides here we'll have some discussion on how we can also support you if there's other ways we can as a county uh, support you during this time. Now I'd like to introduce you to Shalane Hoffman from our Ag, Ag Services Department and Shalane's going to take you through a few um, grant opportunities uh, that will be available. Hi everyone, I am having some technical difficulties so I'm hoping I don't get booted off while speaking but um, I was just going to go over some of the CAP funding that is available. Um, so that's the Canadian Agricultural partnership. Um, it is through the Alberta government and it's not these mm -hmm. still do exist and are accepting that they're going to release producers are facing right now there hasn't been anything yet I haven't heard anything um, so all these grants that I'm going to go over they are a cost share um, at 50% at this time so that did just change recently um, and the first one is the environmental stewardship and climate change grant and this grant helps producers to implement best management practices so um, a lot of their focus areas are on manure management, pesticide application, um, land and water assessments, shelter belt establishment, and uh, they have some for grain bag rollers as well. So if you're interested in that, um, this grant does require you to have an environmental farm plan before applying. So I'll specifically you do need that the next grant that's available that is producer focused is um, the efficient grain dryer grant um, it focuses on grain dryers and grain drying systems that will help to improve energy efficiency um, so that's just above the standard configuration so it does include um, components that 
for retrofitted um, grain dryers or for new equipment that can be installed. installed. So um, for some examples could be a thermostat or high efficiency burners, um, moisture monitoring cables. Uh, that's just to name a few, but I do have that full list in within the presentation. And then also the link at the bottom if you wanted more information on that. Um, this uh, grant does require you to have an environmental uh, plan as well. And then the last grant I'm going to go over is the farm water supply. So this grant supports producers to improve their water supply security and more efficiently manage their on-farm water resources. Um, so some of the things that we'll cover is new well construction, new dugout construction, um, off-source watering systems, as well as well decommissioning. Um, there, it, it does go into a lot more detail on the website, um, so you can check that out through the link. And this one does not require you to have an environmental farm plan, but it does require you to have a long-term water management plan, and that can be done through Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Are there any questions on those? No? Okay. You can move. So just to give a quick overview of the Environmental Farm Plan Program, it is through ERICA, which is a, an association with the Alberta government. Um, they, the program is an environmental, it, sorry, it's a voluntary whole farm self-assessment tool that helps producers identify their environmental risks and develop plans to mitigate identified risks. Working together with farmers committed to environmental stewardship. So that's kind of their vision as a whole. Um, so to complete an environmental farm plan, uh, basically all you would do is go to the, their website, um, which I can direct anyone to after the fact. Um, and then it's just an, it's in an online format. So you would register, create an account, and then a technician in your area would then accept you. So most likely that's going to be me. I am uh, Sturgeon County's um, technician. And then I can help you through the process. In the past, I've done on-farm visits. However, at this time, that isn't really a finished um, you would then submit it to me for review um, whether if it's all good you'll get your certificate of completion in within your email um, if there are a few things I have questions on then I would send it back to you um, and then we go over those questions specifically at the end of your environmental farm plan it does um, come out with an action plan so all of the questions Oh, the audio is a little spotty. Is everyone hearing me okay? Or it's going in and out? I can, I, I can. I'm cutting out, okay. All right, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll try and kind of slow it down. Um, so unheard after the- message. Unheard message, first unheard message. So after, um, when you get your action plan, it's just all of the questions that you would may have not been um, rated the best on, which the best is just their interpretation of um, what the best case scenario is. So it's, it's not a bad thing, but it does make you think about things that you could change um, within your operation. And so that, I guess that leads me to the reasons as to why you would even complete an environmental farm plan. And um, these are just some things that they 
they think could help and myself as well. Um, it helps to identify environmental risks, um, sustainable, it helps with sustainable production of crops, leaving a productive farm for the next generation when you're passing it down. Um, you are eligible for funding through CAP, like I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, consumers are becoming a lot more concerned um, about food safety and where their food's coming from. And so the environmental farm plan is uh, a tool that could represent you in a, in a way that you are stewards of the land and environmentally conscious. And so um, sometimes the public or the government or lenders will ask you to prove that. And this can be a tool to, uh, to do that. So if you do have any um, inquiries about vegetation management, pests, um, egg services, or we're still taking calls and um, running programs as normal, well, not all of them, but <laughs> as best we can. Um, so if you have any inquiries, you can um, give us a call on that top number. And then um, if you have any grant specific questions, um, I would be your contact for that. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to help out however I can or direct you to the right information. Thank you, Shalane. Um, does anyone have any questions? They'd like more information or anything uh, you're wondering about that we've talked about so far? Good morning, I have a question if that's all right. It's Karen. Yeah. Okay, my question to Shalane is, the, um, all of the granting programs for the, uh, the funding programs for beef, that are fat, they're always very convoluted and difficult. So if producers have difficulties, uh, would you be the contact person to help them navigate some of those programs to apply as they become available? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I can, okay. can definitely help support with that. Um, it's, like you said, they are um, quite lengthy and convoluted, but um, and a producer is going to know their operation better than myself, but I am definitely willing to uh, go through the application and um, help where I can for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Jacob. Little gap. I have a quick question. Uh, if I am at the farm plan, uh, <laughs> how often do you have to renew that? So right now the renewal is 10 years. Um, there is talk about them going to a five-year rotation and so that's why they're trying to get everyone online um, instead of using that uh, old binder. So it will be a lot easier in the future to renew um, if you are online because if it is a five-year or five-year rotation then you can just go in and make changes where necessary. But uh, when you have it done uh, 15 years ago and nothing has changed, you still have to do that? Yes, unfortunately, yeah. It, you would have to uh, renew it as of right now. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, it's me, Scott. Um, just, I ha I'm thinking I did my environmental plan in 2010. Is there any way I can go on there and check to see if it's still that? Um, did you do the binder format, Scott? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, they kept some things on file, but not everything. So I can definitely check with my contact um, with Erica and see if they do have your name on file. Okay. And I have another question. Uh, who approves the FIM of the farm, farm plan? Is, is that you, uh, Steph? It is me, yeah. Yeah, so I'll work with you on it. And then um, in the end, yeah, I would go through all the questions and approve them. Oh, that has changed from uh, way in the past. There was a special committee for? 
yeah, that it probably would have been Erica, but yeah, now they have, because the program has grown so much, um, there is a representative in each county that does the environmental farm plan. So um, yeah, I would, I would be that person at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, now we thought we would just have some general discussion around uh, how COVID is, has been impacting your businesses and really, as the mayor mentioned, um, opening up just to really discuss thoughts around innovation, collaboration, and see where we can create opportunities. Um, uh, just kind of curious if anyone would like to share, if anyone has any um, thoughts so far on, on how COVID is impacting their business. And as far as the supports that are currently available, is there anything that, does anyone have any thoughts on maybe what Sturgeon County could offer or any additional offerings from the province or the federal government uh, to support you during this time? Well, this is- uh, It's Karen, if I may. Oh, Absolutely. sorry. I should have waved my apologies. Um, <laughs> I think it, it, it really emphasizes the importance of broadband because uh, from the cattle sector, uh, even in terms of the ability to sell your animals now, um, everything now is being done online. So many of the locations of the farms don't have access to broadband. So I think it's crucial right now that, that the feds get that message, how important it is. Excellent point. Kathy, you can go ahead with your comment. Well, I have two comments. So on the uh, broadband, that's an excellent comment because uh, the broadband that we all have to endure out here is, is pretty uh, poor on a good day. But one of the comments that I'd like to suggest is that you know, we continue to push on the carbon tax because the carbon, you know, we're going into spring, we're all drying grain and the carbon tax is really affecting um, some of our bottom line and some support on that and some pushback on a carbon tax at this time would certainly be beneficial to every farmer in the county. Duly noted. Um, now there were some, so is this the, uh, also then the 50% increase that came in uh, on April 1st? That's correct. Right. That's right. As well as, you know, the, so, the drying. So whatever you were paying more. Um, the cost of drying grain, the carbon tax alone on a tank of propane is huge and add 50% to that it really has increased prices and, and just going forward into spring, it's, you know, everything is increasing prices for farmers. However, um, you know, the, the crop prices are not increasing to reflect the changes. Sure. Very valid point. Well, President, I have a question. When I may? Yeah, you go ahead, Jacob. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you talking? They talking of carbon tax uh, for uh, for grain dryers, but I think it's uh, really important that uh, there is more than only as grain uh, grain farmers. There are poultry farmers. They they have to pay it too, and they uh, they get hit hard too. It's not only grain dryers; it's the whole agriculture sector. And I think that's uh, what has to be. Uh, uh, lobby it to the provincial and the national government. So, Jacob, if I may, uh, Lana here, was, um, like obviously, okay, it's propane for grain dryers on commodities, but for uh, eggs and poultry production, where do you feel the biggest pinch on the carbon tax? Uh, the, the natural gas. Natural gas is the biggest issue. 
the, the, that increased uh, probably is now 1.58 cents per gigajoule, and that's probably uh, almost 50 percent of the 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 gas price. And the real it was okay, really hard in, in the uh, winter time, and yeah, in the summer time too, when we have to uh, eat our barns up. Well, certainly the whole work from home for uh, most of the country has highlighted the uh, the issues around broadband and definitely uh, elevated that. Um, and I know that's something we're working on at Sturgeon County. And I know even in the greater Edmonton metropolitan region with the other um, 12 uh, municipalities that sit on that, it, it's, it's seen as a really important infrastructure to get it and so we we are making some headway there and i know it doesn't feel like it's fast enough but but if there is a silver line uh to this it's that you know the the voices before us need better broad and amplify uh, several times over and we're not uh, we're not So um, be interested just to kind of get some thoughts around collaboration and and oh, Leanne, Kathy actually just raised her hand. She has another comment before oh, we move sorry. on, if you don't mind. Thanks. Oh, it, it doesn't matter. But I, I was just thinking, yeah, Jacob brings up a good point. But my comment is it's farming all inclusive, whether it's dairy, grain farm, all the fuel, all the diesel, all the fertilizer inputs, everything will be subject to carbon tax. So um, as I, I like, I, I wasn't particularly just pointing out grain drying, but that's just some one small aspect that has a huge impact. But all farming within the whole county will be impacted by this increase in carbon tax and the carbon tax in general. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm curious, um, as far as collaboration and, and innovating, um, as far as changes in the marketplace and market access, what are you guys seeing as far as um, maybe opportunities to do something different or like how are you guys having to change what you're doing uh, as a farmer during this time? When I may, uh, there's personal. I didn't have to change anything on my farm. Only, uh, yeah, I produce duck eggs and quail eggs. And uh, mm -hmm. I make sure that the people who are picking the eggs for me, that they don't travel to, to the city or something. That uh, I have to go once, once a week to the city because to deliver eggs and that's, I'm in and out and have all the precautions what I have to do. Excellent. And how about markets? Like, are you still finding, um, are you still finding there are people that are buying them? Are you having to find new places to sell or your markets are still in place? No, my, uh, I'm selling to an, uh, to a guy who uh, does f further processing. It's an, it's a niche market for us. It's a niche market for Alberta. It's a uh, balut duck eggs. And that goes all to the Asian Asian people here in Alberta, and uh, they sell them to T and T and uh, Lucky Seven, and okay. they go to uh, Winnipeg, uh, BC, and so. There's, it, there's no impact on this moment. That's great. So it looks like Karen and Tyler both raised their hands. So we'll go with Karen first, and then Tyler after. So thank you. So thank you for that. So from the cattle sector, the only thing really that's different now is the access to the auction marts for producers. Uh, you can still ship your animals. Prices are remaining strong. I think the demand uh, presently for beef will be even higher in terms of uh, ground beef. So there's really no change other than the fact um, the, the impact, say if you yesterday we picked up feed um, 
it actually is quicker because you can't go into the building and they've got the bulk bag ready to load for you. So in some ways, it's, it's easier. So it's, um, right now, there's not a lot of impact to the livestock sector that we're seeing at a producer level. If I may just jump in, Karen, I have a question. When you're mentioning online auctions, was that something that happened after COVID or was that just the way the industry moved prior to for beef sales? No, it's, it's, uh, it depends. If you're, if you're speaking, purchasing bulls and, and replacement heifers, those generally were always available online, but this is the actual the uh or the the auction houses the pinocas the vjvs the uh, the clyde the north central they all are now doing it um they're doing it online so they're they're only allowing the last time i looked which was last week they're only allowing uh and they might not even be doing that anymore. At one time they were only allowing, if you were going to a sale, they would allow you to come in and they would allow up to 50, one person per buyer. And um, you could go in and look at the animals, but that was it. Um, but now I don't even think they're doing that. So everything, uh, I'm guessing just by the sheer volume of notifications of online auctions that, that I'm getting every day, that they're not allowing anybody in anymore physically. So yes, that's new in terms of marketing your calves. We don't market our calves this time of year, we market in the fall. So I'll see what that turns to at that point. Thanks, Karen. Tyler, did you wanna make a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you very much everyone for your time today. Uh, I'm with Sturgeon County as well. Um, wanted to just maybe offer out for the group there as well as uh, further to Leanne's comment about some opportunities that you may be seeing or, you know, really have you had a shift or a change in some of the practices that you have on your own farm or with your operation. But um, ultimately what we're trying to figure out right now as well, if you can include with your answer, is has COVID impacted yourselves? And if so, we would anticipate that it has. But if so, then how has that impacted you as well? If, um, Jacob and Karen, you've done a great job of, of letting us know some of those pieces, but for others that are on the call as well, if you'd be able to let us know some of those pieces of information, we would very much appreciate that as well. I'd like to uh, add in a comment when it's possible. What I heard the uh, hog market is uh, really affected, that the hog prices are down. Um, looks like Councillor Como has raised his hand, but I'm not sure if it's Councillor Como or Councillor Bokenfor. Either one can go ahead. No, actually, it's, it's it's myself, and I was noticing that every time I was turning my raised hand, Neil was getting uh, the, the hand go up there, and my, my name wasn't coming up. So <laughs> so obviously, we got a phone number glitch there and how that, that came in on someone's phone. But um, uh, my comments is kind of a, 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 a extension of what Tyler was saying. Um, this this heading that we're under right now, we were talking about innovation, and innovation also comes with access to broadband. And so um, I was on a, a conference call yesterday. I, I sit on uh, one of the members. Uh, I'm one of the members for FCM, and Rural Forum had 48 members from across Canada. Um, we're addressing broadband on a national basis. Um, FCM has asked uh, our municipalities to come back with what are you finding as limitations within your own industries and your businesses within the broadband. So what is it stopping you from doing, whether it's uh, doing your books, your education, is it stopping um, farm automation from happening, taking place? These are the comments that I would like to get back. Um, we have to respond back in writing to um, FCM um, probably within the next week because the, the deadline to get back to the CRTC is April 23rd. So this was an initiative that just started uh, yesterday. And so uh, I'm taking this opportunity to talk to our agribusinesses that in the rural areas that are affected by not having 
the internet and broadband, is it affecting your business operations? Is it affecting future business operations? And what are those limitations so that we can um, itemize them and put that in a concise letter that we can send back? Thank you. Can I uh, give a comment on that? Uh, I'm sitting on the I'm sitting on the uh, committee from uh, the Federation of Cars Co-ops, and we uh, we have an uh, we try to set pilot programs up uh, for uh, high high speed internet, and there's involved this CCI, um, the government is involved, the REAs are in, uh, the Federation of uh, REAs are involved. And I have a conference call this afternoon again and see how it goes because we don't know how it goes with the coronavirus on this moment. I'll go ahead, David, with your comment. Hi, Dave Kluth calling. And um, I just want to add to the talk about the ag business in the, in the county. I have talked to quite a few of them already and how they're going to deal with it this spring. Most of them have plans in place already. Uh, like Ritchie Brothers allows viewing only under appointment before auctions and all even on farm auctions are done now online. Uh, the uh, cattle buying, like Karen had mentioned, it's uh, viewing under appointment only and only designated buyers are allowed in the ring and those are usually the ones that are buying for big companies. Everybody else has to go online now. So I'm finding that the ag industry in the county is already making some really good strides and plans to deal with this situation. And uh, like I said, like Jacob said about the county, should lobby the government to carbon tax should be eliminated, period, never mind just for farmers. It's not the time to be putting this on people. Uh, other than that, I think that's my only comments. Thank you. So David, thanks for your comments. Um, further to that, I'm just curious, how are you finding it to adapt? Were you guys um, doing a lot online prior to this or are you, you finding everyone's adapting quite well? And then are there any, are there any benefits that you're seeing to doing more online? Um, no, I think, uh, well, our family, we've already, we're distanced ourselves from each other just so in case somebody gets it, we'll be able to still put the crop in with the other family members. So I'm sure everybody else is kind of doing the same thing because the uh, seasons don't wait two weeks for quarantine. And uh, as far as the online thing, everybody's been doing more and more year to year. And this just kind of sped up the process as far as I can see. If I can ask Dave, what's your broadband like uh, at your farm or at your family's farms? And, and also did like cell phone coverage. We have no issues anywhere, no matter where we have the tractor in which field up by Gibbons, by St. Albert, by Mournville, it's all fine. I'm sitting in my truck talking to you on my cell phone, on my coverage. So it's, I think broadband in the area is actually pretty good. It might be just a few niche small areas. That's good to know. Yeah, it definitely seems to be a spotty. Some ha have great coverage and, and others uh, don't. Yeah, I haven't noticed that anything, any issues with mine. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Karen, go ahead with your comment. Thank you. Um, Dave, you're really lucky because you live in a fairly flat area in, in the east part of the county where it's very, it's hilly with lots of trees, broadband is a huge issue, uh, having the ability for reception. And there are many areas that the local providers won't even go in because they can't, they just can't get reception because of the topography of the land. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll respond, respond to that. Thanks, Karen. Um, I, I do agree with you. I've heard of lots of people complain about their areas. I must be fortunate because where we are, we have never had an issue. But I have heard of people, even even by River Kabar, there's issues. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure if the towers are a little too far apart in areas or what the issue is, but I'm one of the lucky ones, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't mind <clears throat> speaking up uh, on behalf of McEwen, this Mike Gomo here. 
Um, we're just east of, or west of uh, Bonacord and our, our coverage is not very good at all. We've tried to, uh, we've doubled our service uh, with ExploreNet and it doesn't seem to be helping a lot. Um, we have to have our server offsite in Fort Saskatchewan. And uh, for us trying to move our, our head office into the county, it's, it's, it's had some definite challenges. Um, forcing us to work a uh, few people from home and, and, and limit what we can do at our office here. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. We're going to have to get some kind of a coverage uh, map done, which I, I know we did a study a couple of years ago with Morinville through the ECDEV department and they started to map some of it, but the unfortunate part is a lot of that infrastructure, the dark fiber is, uh, is not public knowledge because the the utilities the companies that put it in kind of want to keep that to themselves but i know uh, minister glubish at service alberta has been pressuring uh, telecoms to come forward and talk about where their fiber is uh, and telus has committed i think it was 16 16 million dollars to improving uh fiber which you know we want to be able to get directly to them and talk to them about where they're actually putting that fiber so that it can be very strategic um, so we'll we'll work um, diligently to uh, improve uh, broadband and obviously speak to the carbon tax um, loud and clear with our members of parliament and our mlas um, so we got two more people with their hands up. Kathy, go ahead first, and then Neil, Councillor Como. To comment that we are on a satellite internet, and uh, it can be hit and miss at times. And certainly, when there's inclement weather, we suffer from poor uh, uh, poor broadband, and um, especially during peak times, and especially I would say uh, eight thirty this morning. I can tell you, we had a huge hiccup. Um, when you're trying to do something that may or may not be critical, but certainly uh, those of us that are in the county, and I think it's probably many people who are subject to uh, satellite, uh, broad, satellite internet, uh, we, we are at the mercy of a smaller company, uh, small, uh, small company assistance when we need it, and uh, unpredictable outages. Sorry, what division are you in? Just so I can take note of that. Oh, okay. we're in three. Okay, thank you. Can I uh, react to Mike? Mike, uh, did you uh, try to have uh, contact different providers? Uh, yeah, we've tried a couple here. The, the TELUS hub does work. Uh, it's, it's pretty expensive for the amount of uh, volume we would need for, for data here to run. You know, if we try and move this to be our head office uh, for eight sites, it just won't seem to work with our server being, being on site. Okay. Yeah, because I have a MSN net, uh, but that's closer to my home, uh, and I live on IB28 between Kibbers and Redwater. There's a, there are more 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 providers out in this area. I think it's more of an infrastructure than a than a service provider issue. Uh, I know, you know, I, I can walk to Morinville, I'm that close. Uh, we're flat land, we've got clear line of sight to all the towers, but I've been through two different service providers uh, since being out here, and they've tried a number of different locations for their uh, receivers and a number of different types of modems. Uh, and there's still just, there, there's problems in, in rural areas and, and we need to ask, uh, for better infrastructure uh, just across the board before um, before service providers are going to have enough infrastructure to be able to provide what we need going forward. 
Uh, Councillor Bokenpore Como, I see your hands up. Did you have a comment? It's not me. Yeah, it's me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so I was just going to speak to the broadband as well. I'm in the far west of the county and we, I think everyone is feeling the pinch with the kids are at home trying to do their schoolwork, you name it. And we've tried multiple providers out here and there's just isn't a solution right now. It is just until the bigger picture is addressed, it doesn't matter what provider you're with. Talus Hubs has said that won't even work in our area. Um, you know, we've looked at CCI, they said no. MCA, MCS Net works a little bit, but I think further to Mr. Gomont's comment, it's just we need to, to figure out a better solution for all of the county, not just the spot areas. Perhaps a, a takeaway, just going back to the Economic Development Department. I know when when the uh, broadband study was done a couple of years ago, uh, we had a link on our website uh, where you could actually do speed tests. Mm -hmm. And and I think that our, that reach out originally for that was more kind of through businesses. Uh, perhaps uh, we can have a look at what it would take to do a larger rollout request for for speed tests throughout the county and and maybe specify our producers this time out not uh, well anybody actually the, i think we need to get a better picture of what our download speeds actually are and then start to plot out because as we as the province figures out where the infrastructure is we can at least tell the story of where the problems are and where there's strength and then uh, kind of mesh those, uh, uh, those facts together to come up with a solution. Perfect. Oh, go ahead, Tyler. Madam Mayor, you bring up an excellent point there, and I think it presents an opportunity for us to, um, as an, even as an organization, to, to look at updating some of those speed tests, if anything else, so we can look at working in collaboration with um, our IT department and seeing how we can best bring that forward in short order um, hopefully for at least some quick discussions on how we can have that through and see uh, hopefully realistically what we can get done here right away and really start to dig in to solve this issue as we move ahead as well. So um, great, great point for sure. And I think those numbers could definitely be updated to be able to showcase with high usage of the network right now and how that's impacting, especially, uh, you know, a really important industry like uh, agriculture for us as well and just how this is impacting your guys' everyday lives as well. There's nothing like data to be able to actually go to our members of parliament uh, and the province to show where the issues are. Because uh, if you're going to expect people to pay carbon tax, they're obviously going to need really robust businesses. Uh, so you need to uh, enable that by uh, bringing, you know, minimizing the digital divide that we're currently living under here. Wonderful discussion. And as uh, as mentioned earlier, we will be certainly doing a lot of takeaway um, items with this. So we're happy to follow up and um, continue conversations. Um, we are planning on probably setting up a couple of working groups to really get into a lot of these issues. And one of the other things we wanted to to discuss today was just around um, innovation and, and services that could help your business either grow or adapt better. Um, just for example, are, is there anything as a producer in the county that you feel is, is really lacking as far as like if there was something, say, cold storage, cold packing, um, maybe access to more local grocery supply chains, is there anything that would really benefit you to have here in the county that we don't currently have?
Go ahead, Kathy. Um, this may or may not be appropriate, and it's maybe to support some of the smaller producers or the the um, you know the farmers market niche. But you know maybe we could look at some kind of uh, shop local task force or really starting to promote shop local on the county website. Um, maybe we start a shop local co-op. Uh, maybe there is something that we as a group can uh, pull together to start showcasing all of the great companies and businesses who offer products within the county um, to really start having people look at what we produce locally and trying to really um, support some of the smaller companies within the county who have uh, been impacted by uh, the possible shutdown of farmers markets. I mean, maybe they are, will or will not be canceled, but certainly uh, the, tr the trade shows and all of the small shows that people would sell, everything from beef jerky to eggs to homemade products to jams and jellies to all the small, small market um, areas of uh, companies. Uh, maybe there's something that we can do to start promoting shop local. I, that is a great point and it's nice to hear. Um, we've seen so far a lot of support for uh, shop local. We've had um, a lot of our market gardens get quite a few phone calls People are interested in really supporting local and, and finding out what they can get. So it's definitely on the radar. Um, we will be certainly working through some of that and we'd love to um, invite you guys. We'll send out some emails, but just a little more engagement on this to see how we can get more people involved. Um, one of our challenges is just the size of the county. <laughs> There's so many people doing wonderful things. So we just, we need to, to dig it out and, um, and learn about who's doing what so we can promote it. Absolutely. Sorry, uh, it's Alana here. I My call got dropped again, so I missed some of what was said uh, around the supporting local. But um, I know online, I was on the website for the Red Hat uh, Cooperative uh, in Southern Alberta. Uh, so even, which kind of got me thinking about <clears throat> even like a landing page where we can introduce our producers to the, the general public, whether, whether that's to um, make that introduction for people to be able to go to the farm, uh, whether it's by appointment only or however that looks or online ordering, or uh, whether it's just starting to build up that profile and work to get producers uh, goods on local store shelves, whatever it looks like. But uh, the um, the Red Hat Co-op website was just great because there's a picture of the producer. They talk about what they grow, uh, and I think that's a that's maybe a, a place to start around encouraging local understanding, local knowledge, local food supply. Um, go ahead, Councillor Shaw. Then Councillor Bulkenfor. Thank you. I think it's uh, really imperative that we also advocate to the provincial government the value of the rope in the web uh, website that the province discontinued and what a valuable uh, resource it was to producers and uh, for various aspects karen when when did that one um stop being used uh, I can't give you a specific date, but I know at the Ag Service Board conference, it was even a resolution to mm -hmm. advocate to bringing it back in. So it's been a, at least a year, but it's a very valuable site for producers to, to access uh, any commodity that they're looking to either buy or to sell. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very good resource for, from everything for, for, you know, pasture to to land, uh, to be able to farm, to sell and purchase commodities. It's, it was well used. I've heard that from a few people. So let's, uh, we'll check into that for sure. That'd be my turn now? Yep, you bet. Um, I guess my comment is, is that um, um, 
when we look at um, commodities and everything else, um, everybody is, is selling their own individual little um, picture or a little piece of heaven or a little piece of product that they do. But um, what I found interesting is that when uh, we were in the, the Niagara region, they call it the Niagara region. So there's a whole bunch of things that are made, whether it's cheeses, wines, um, any other, you know, in the produce. And when it came from that region, it, it had an expectation of being good quality in that. Do we not reach the moment in time where we should be looking at branding sturgeon and so that we have the sturgeon region so that we know it's the, you know, organic, it's the best quality, you know, the, you know, all the things that, you know, the lentils, all the things that, you know, was, was said earlier. I think it's maybe the moment in time that we need to brand sturgeon and have everybody underneath globally so that maybe it's our time or turn to look at our um, as a county to start doing promotion a little bit better for our agribusiness so I'm just putting that out there and uh, I'm uh, maybe seeing if Regan might have a comment on that as well because uh, he came from the Niagara region uh, go ahead David um, I just a quick uh, question be to like Mike Gomo at McEwen's uh, have you guys got any plans in place for the spring for when we pick up fertilizer? You guys got ships going so you, in case somebody gets sick that the place doesn't have to shut down? Because um, to me, that's the most important thing in, in the county is being keeping these businesses running during the two during the weeks that we need it to operate to put the crop in. Yeah, good question, Dave. Um, for sure, that that's one of our biggest uh, worries is is if if somebody does get contaminated, what what is the uh, touch points and how far does that spread throughout our businesses or or further out in through a farm? We know we know a lot of our farm customers offer operate with very limited staff, and uh, you know if somebody gets sick, how how is that going to affect them and us? Um, so yeah, we've we've got multiple. Uh, segregation in our in our shift staff there's people that aren't allowed to see each other uh, to try and eliminate uh, if somebody does get sick it's not taking down four or five people um, as far as uh, customers we've really discouraged any any site visits uh, everything's done by phone calls uh, all the planning uh, we will definitely have some some different on-site protocols this year than we've ever had um, uh, really limiting access to uh, whether it's outside public or and including customers, um, so yeah, it is going to change the business. We're going to do our best to still get the product out as efficiently uh, as we can. Um, our delivery service shouldn't be affected too much. Um, just our site pickups definitely won't be as friendly, but uh, you know, we'll be here all the hours that we plan to be even potentially more. Well, thank you, Mike, on that. Uh... Yeah, we're doing the same thing. We're social distancing at our place too to make sure we, not everybody is sick. So good on you guys and I hope everybody else does the same. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, also go back to Councillor Bokenforce's comments um, around the branding. So. Um, as far as raising awareness for shopping local and getting a bit of a campaign going, that's certainly one of the action items um, from these, this series of, of webinars. We've got three others coming up. Um, so we are very happy to get input from you and uh, we'll continue to engage going forward. Um, getting all of, all of your information and insights is really critical to finding something that works for Sturgeon County. Um, we have so many producers out here and we, we'd love to um, really promote as much as we can. So just know that that is an action item and we'll certainly be um, following up um, with anyone that's interested in, in participating further on engaging. Are there any other uh, comments or discussion points anyone would like to um, chat about? I see the mayor up? has her hand up. Okay. I finally learned how to use the, uh, the, the appropriate functions instead of just interrupting. Uh, so a couple of questions around um, business continuity for farmers if they get sick. I know, you know normally in a community, if your neighbor falls on hard times, uh, you know, somebody else shows up with the equipment and the staff, 
to do what needs to be done in the time frame it needs to be done. But without knowing the full impact of how many will become ill and unable to work, is there uh, any benefit or perhaps there already is amongst fellow producers to have kind of a list of people who you can call on um, kind of a list of volunteers at the ready who have the capacity to maybe send one or two pieces of equipment or people into somebody else's field uh, or what, you know, depending on what their, what, what their uh, farm produces just to help out. Because as you know, if somebody gets sick or has cancer or, you know, everybody always just shows up, but it's usually because it's a one-off it's, it's just one person, you know, but depending how this rolls out, it can be more than just one person you know that can't operate normally. And so is there some benefit in, in preparation to get a few people that have the skills um, to be able to kind of pinch hit for people when needed? So that was kind of one question. And the other question was around um, for, you know, McEwen's or other farmers out there, is there concern around access for some of the PPE and some of the training to appropriately use that PPE that you might need uh, to utilize in the coming weeks and months? I uh, comment first of all on the, the training and PPE. Uh, a lot of that has switched over the last five, six years to, to online training, uh, followed with uh, hands-on training at our sites anyway. Um, so that part is not an issue. Um, we were struggling a little bit to get some extra uh, uh, dust masks. I mean, we, we do go through quite a bit with the granular fertilizer at our sites anyways. Um, I think we're going to be okay with some respirators. Uh, as far as uh, um, the cross training of, of staff, it is fairly specialized what we do. So we do have some, some backups for people getting sick. Um, as far as going us into the industry, though, to our farmers, I, you know, I can't see us being able to help uh, a lot if something goes down. You know, other than we are trying to help support our farmers if they, in making COVID plans and, and how to, like Dave said, segregate themselves from each other to limit potential exposure of uh, each other on the farm, whether it's uh, father-son um, pairs. And because and lots of our concerns are you know there's two three four people working on a farm and it is devastating if they lose 50 percent of their staff in a season like this are there any other uh comments or questions um anyone would like to bring up uh, go ahead, Steve, you have your hand up. Hi, yeah, uh, it's Steve here with North Parkland Power REA. I just wanted to uh, just point out that we've implemented our business continuity plan almost a month ago. Uh, we've segregated shifts. We've, we've got all our planning in place so that uh, we can continue to deliver service, you know, as close to usual as possible. So, because uh, we do service about the east half of the county uh, for a lot of rural residents and uh, farms. So anyways, I just wanted to point it out that, that we're ready for it. So thank you. Okay, well, if there's no other uh, comments or questions, I think we'll wrap up a little bit early. Um, thank you so much for your time today and uh, we will be contacting some of you further to see if you're interested in, in engaging to help us develop some of the plans that we're hoping to get into place soon. Um, we do have another three upcoming workshops. They're posted there on the screen. Um, so one focused more around a value-added egg group of people, uh, horticulture, so greenhouses, um, sod farms, landscapers, and then also large commodity producers. So we're very much hoping to hear what you all have to say and how, how we can help and also just how we can collaborate and create new opportunities during this time. Um, and our website is there. Please reach out anytime. Um, and I'll 
throw it back to you, Madam Mayor. And Tyler also had a comment to make as well. Oh. Thanks very much. Uh, just wanted to reiterate to folks there is that if you have some interest in any of those upcoming workshops, if you can register early on those, we're building those as we go along here right now. But if we know um, how how many folks are able to come into it, that type of thing, very helpful for us. And we definitely do, like I, uh, hopefully this is showed here today, we really do want to engage with yourselves in, in the industry here to make sure that we're understanding what your challenges may be, where some opportunities are, where some innovation may be, and how we can really um, in, encourage, facilitate, uh, engage with yourselves in the, in the best way possible so that we can all get through this and you know, hopefully have you stronger as we get through it as well, because then that way we as Sturgeon County uh, are stronger because of, of that as well. So I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up and, and please do encourage you to uh, come into some of those other workshops that we have upcoming. Thank you for that, Tyler uh, and to Leanne for uh, pulling this together. And as you can see, those other workshops coming forward, if you have an interest in them, or even if you've heard uh, other speakers elsewhere or, or read something somewhere that you think might be beneficial, please let us know because we can uh, consider having guest speakers come and share information and, and brainstorm with us. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to hear that for the most part, uh, you guys are ready for what's coming, uh, and I'm I'm also uh, appreciate the reinforcement of uh, of the carbon tax hurdle and the broadband as being uh, something that's imperative for us to be able to really take our place uh, in in the world as far as being able to offer um, some of the best products uh, to the world, but knowing that with the digital economy, we need access to that. So I just wanna thank everyone for taking the time today and for being patient as we work through uh, these, these virtual meetings. Just a really heartfelt thank you and hope that you get to enjoy uh, virtual meetings or phone calls with your family uh, over the Easter break. Thank you everyone, take care. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, just to before we wrap up, that we'll be sending up a sending out a survey to all you participants, just to get some feedback on this session. Um, you know, taking the time to fill that out is really valuable information for us so, so as we move forward. So you should see that in the next couple of days, and I, we we would really appreciate you taking five minutes just to sort of give us your feedback so that um, we can move ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Take care. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah. Yeah, Stay happy. safe, everybody. Yep. Good Friday as well.